Rune 1 of The Kalevala. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Kalevala, compiled by Elias Lunroot. Translated by John Martin Crawford. Rune 1 Birth of Vainamoinen. In primeval times a maiden, beauteous daughter of the ether, passed for ages her existence in the great expanse of heaven. O'er the prairies yet enfolded, wearisome the maiden growing, her existence sad and hopeless, thus alone to live for ages in the infinite expanses. Of the air above the sea foam, in the far outstretching spaces, in a solitude of ether, she descended to the ocean, waves her coach and waves her pillow. Thereupon the rising storm wind, flying from the east in fierceness, whips the ocean into surges, strikes the stars with sprays of ocean, till the waves are white with fervor. To and fro they toss the maiden, storm-encircled hapless maiden, with her sport the rolling billows, with her play the storm-wind forces, on the blue back of the waters, on the white-wreathed waves of ocean, play the forces of the salt sea with the lone and helpless maiden, till at last in full conception, union now of force and beauty, sink the storm-winds into slumber, overburdened now the maiden cannot rise above the surface, Seven hundred years she wandered, ages nine of man's existence, swam the ocean hither, thither, could not rise above the waters, conscious only of her travail. Seven hundred years she labored, ere her firstborn was delivered. Thus she swam as water mother, toward the east and also southward, toward the west and also northward, swam the sea in all directions, frightened at the strife of storm winds, swam in travail, swam unceasing, ere her firstborn was delivered. Then began she gently weeping, spake these measures heavy-hearted. Woe is me, my life hard fated, woe is me in this my travail. Into what have I now fallen, woe is me that I, unhappy, left my home in subtle ether, came to dwell amid the sea-foam, to be tossed by rolling billows, to be rocked by winds and waters, on the far outstretching waters, in the salt sea's vast expanses, knowing only pain and trouble. Better far for me, O Uko, were I maiden in the ether, than within these ocean spaces, to become a water mother. All this life is cold and dreary, painful here is every motion, as I linger in the waters, as I wander through the ocean. Uko, thou, O God up yonder, thou the ruler of the heavens, come thou hither, thou art needed, come thou hither, I implore thee, to deliver me from trouble, to deliver me in travail. Come, I pray thee, hither hasten, hasten more that thou art needed, haste and help this helpless maiden. When she ceased her supplications, scarce a moment onward passes, ere a beauteous duck descending hastens toward the water mother, comes a-flying hither, thither, seeks herself a place for nesting, flies she eastward, flies she westward, circles northward, circles southward, cannot find a grassy hillock, not the smallest bit of verdure, cannot find a spot protected, cannot find a place befitting, where to make her nest in safety. Flying slowly, looking round her, she descries no place for resting, thinking loud and long debating, and her words are such as follow. Build I in the winds my dwelling, on the floods my place of nesting? Surely would the winds destroy it, far away the waves would wash it. Then the daughter of the ether, now the hapless water mother, raised her shoulders out of water, raised her knees above the ocean, that the duck might build her dwelling, build her nesting place in safety. Thereupon the duck in beauty, flying slowly, looking round her, spies the shoulders of the maiden, sees the knees of Ether's daughter. Now the hapless water mother thinks them to be grassy hillocks on the blue back of the ocean. Thence she flies and hovers slowly, lightly on the knee she settles, finds a nesting place befitting, where to lay her eggs in safety. Here she builds her humble dwelling, lays her eggs within at pleasure. Six the golden egg she lays there, then a seventh an egg of iron. Sits upon her eggs to hatch them, quickly warms them on the kneecap of the hapless water mother. Hatches one day, then a second, then a third day sits and hatches. 
Warmer grows the water round her, warmer is her bed in ocean, while her knee with fire is kindled, and her shoulders too are burning, fire in every vein is coursing. Quick the maiden moves her shoulders, shakes her members in succession, shakes the nest from its foundation, and the eggs fall into ocean, dash in pieces on the bottom of the deep and boundless waters. In the sand they do not perish, not the pieces in the ocean, but transformed in wondrous beauty, all the fragments come together, forming pieces two in number, one the upper, one the lower, equal to the one the other. From one half the egg, the lower, grows the nether vault of Terra, from the upper half remaining grows the upper vault of heaven. From the white part come the moonbeams, from the yellow part the sunshine, from the motley part the starlight, from the dark part grows the cloudage. And the days speed onward swiftly, quickly do the years fly over, from the shining of the new sun, from the lighting of the full moon. Still the daughter of the ether swims the sea as water mother, with the floods outstretched before her and behind her sky and ocean. Finally about the ninth year, in the summer of the tenth year, lifts her head above the surface, lifts her forehead from the waters, and begins at last her workings, now commences her creations, on azure water ridges, on the mighty waste before her. Where her hand she turned in water, there arose a fertile hillock. Wheresoe'er her foot she rested, there she made a hole for fishes. Where she dived beneath the waters, fell the many deeps of ocean. Where upon her side she turned her, there the level banks have risen. Where her head was pointed landward, there appeared wide bays and inlets. Where from shore she swam a distance, and upon her back she rested. There the rocks she made and fashioned, and the hidden reefs created. Where the ships are wrecked so often, where so many lives have perished. Thus created were the islands, rocks were fastened in the ocean, pillars of the sky were planted, fields and forests were created, checkered stones of many colors, gleaming in the silver sunlight, all the rocks stood well established. But the singer Venomoinen had not yet beheld the sunshine, had not seen the golden moonlight, still remaining undelivered. Venomoinen, old and trusty, lingering within his dungeon, thirty summers all together, and the winters also thirty, peaceful on the waste of waters, on the broad sea's yielding bosom, well reflected, long considered, how unborn to live and flourish, in the spaces wrapped in darkness, in uncomfortable limits, where he had not seen the moonlight, had not seen the silver sunshine. Thereupon these words be uttered, let himself be heard in this wise. Take, O moon, I pray thee, take me. Take me thou, O sun above me. Take me thou, O bear of heaven, from this dark and dreary prison, from these unbefitting portals, from this narrow place of resting, from this dark and gloomy dwelling, hence to wander from the ocean, hence to walk upon the islands, on the dry land walk and wander, like an ancient hero wander, walk in open air and breathe it, Thus to see the moon at evening, thus to see the silver sunlight, thus to see the bear in heaven, that the stars I may consider. Since the moon refused to free him, and the sun would not deliver, nor the gray bear give assistance, his existence growing weary, and his life but an annoyance, bursts he then the outer portals of his dark and dismal fortress. With his strong but unnamed finger, opens he the lock resisting, with the toes upon his left foot, with the fingers of his right hand, creeps he through the yielding portals, to the threshold of his dwelling, on his knees across the threshold, throws himself head foremost forward, plunges into deeps of ocean, plunges hither, plunges thither, turning with his hands the water, swims he northward, swims he southward, swims he eastward, swims he westward, studying his new surroundings. Thus our hero reached the water, rested five years in the ocean, six long years and even seven years, till the autumn of the eighth year, when at last he leaves the waters, stops upon a promontory, on a coast bereft of verdure, on his knees he leaves the ocean, on the land he plants his right foot, on the solid ground his left foot, quickly turns his hands about him, stands erect to see the sunshine, stands to see the golden moonlight, that he may behold the great bear, that he may the stars consider. Thus our hero, Venomoinen, thus the wonderful enchanter, was delivered from his mother, Ilmatar, the ether's daughter. End of Rune One Recording by Kyle Robb Rune Two of The Kalevala 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Kalevala, compiled by Elias Lunroot. Translated by John Martin Crawford. Rune 2. Vainamoinen's Sewing. Then arose old Vainamoinen with his feet upon the island, on the island washed by ocean, broad expanse devoid of verdure. There remained he many summers, there he lived as many winters, on the island vast and vacant, well considered, long reflected. Who for him should sow the island? Who for him the seeds should scatter? Thought at last of Pelervoinen, firstborn of the plains and prairies, when a slender boy called Samsa, who should sow the vacant island, who the forest seeds should scatter. Pelervoinen, thus consenting, sows with diligence the island, seeds upon the lands he scatters, seeds in every swamp and lowland, forced seeds upon the loose earth, on the firm soil sows the acorns, fir trees sows he on the mountains, pine trees also on the hilltops, many shrubs in every valley, birches sows he in the marshes, in the loose soil sows the alders, in the lowlands sows the lindens, in the moist earth sows the willow, mountain ash in virgin places, on the banks of streams the hawthorn, junipers in hilly regions. This the work of Pelervoinen, slender Samsa, in his childhood. Soon the fertile seeds were sprouting, soon the forest trees were growing, soon appeared the tops of fir trees, and the pines were far outspreading. Birches rose from all the marshes, in the loose soil grew the alders, in the mellow soil the lindens. Junipers were also growing, junipers with clustered berries, berries on the hawthorn branches. Now the hero, Vainamoinen, stands aloft to look about him, how the Samsa seeds are growing, how the crop of Pelervoinen sees the young trees thickly spreading, sees the forest rise in beauty. But the oak tree has not sprouted, tree of heaven is not growing, still within the acorn sleeping, its own happiness enjoying. Then he waited three nights longer, and as many days he waited, waited till a week had vanished, then again the work examined. But the oak tree was not growing, had not left her acorn dwelling. Vainamoinen, ancient hero, spies four maidens in the distance, water brides he spies a fifth one, on the soft and sandy seashore, in the dewy grass and flowers, on a point extending seaward near the forests of the island. Some were mowing, some were raking, raking what was mown together, in a windrow on the meadow. From the ocean rose a giant, mighty Tursus, tall and hardy pressed compactly all the grasses that the maidens had been raking, when a fire within them kindles, and the flames shot up to heaven, till the windrows burned to ashes, only ashes now remaining, of the grasses raked together. In the ashes of the windrows, tender leaves the giant places, in the leaves he plants an acorn, from the acorn, quickly sprouting, grows the oak tree, tall and stately, from the ground enriched by ashes, newly raked by water maidens. Spread the oak tree's many branches, rounds itself a broad corona, raises it above the storm clouds, far it stretches out its branches, stops the white clouds in their courses, with its branches hides the sunlight, with its many leaves the moonbeams, and the starlight dies in heaven. Vainamoinen, old and trusty, thought a while and well considered how to kill the mighty oak tree, first created for his pleasure, how to fell the tree majestic, how to lop its hundred branches. Sad the lives of man and hero, sad the homes of ocean dwellers, if the sun shines not upon them, if the moonlight does not cheer them. Is there not some mighty hero? Was there never born a giant that can fell the mighty oak tree, that can lop its hundred branches? Vainamoinen, deeply thinking, spake these words, soliloquizing, Kape, daughter of the ether. Ancient mother of my being, Luonatar, my nurse and helper, loan to me the water forces, great the powers of the waters. Loan to me the strength of oceans, to upset this mighty oak tree, to uproot this tree of evil, that again may shine the sunlight, that the moon once more may glimmer. Straightway rose a form from oceans, rose a hero from the waters, nor belonged he to the largest, nor belonged he to the smallest, long was he as man's forefinger, taller than the hand of woman, on his head a cap of copper, boots upon his feet were copper, gloves upon his hands were copper, and its stripes were copper colored, belt around him made of copper, hatchet in his belt was copper, and the handle of his hatchet was as long as hand of woman, of a finger's breadth the blade was. 
Then the trusty Vainamoinen thought a while, and well considered, and his measures are as follow. Art thou, sir, divine or human, which of these thou only knowest? Tell me what thy name and station, very like a man thou lookest, hast the bearing of a hero, though the length on man's first finger, scarce as tall as hoof of reindeer. Then again spake Vainamoinen to the form from out the ocean. Verily I think thee human, of the race of pygmy heroes, might as well be dead or dying, fit for nothing but to perish. Answered thus the pygmy hero, spake the small one from the ocean, to the valiant Vainamoinen. Truly I am god and hero, from the tribes that rule the ocean. Come I here to fell the oak tree, lop its branches with my hatchet. Vainamoinen, old and trusty, answers thus the seaborn hero, Never hast thou force sufficient, nor to thee has strength been given to uproot this mighty oak tree, to uproot this thing of evil, nor to lop its hundred branches. Scarcely had he finished speaking, scarcely had he moved his eyelids, ere the pygmy fool unfolding quick becomes a mighty giant. With one step he leaves the ocean, plants himself a mighty hero on the forest fields surrounding. With his head the clouds he pierces, to his knees his beard extending, and his locks fall to his ankles, far apart appear his eyeballs, far apart his feet are stationed, farther still his mighty shoulders. Now begins his axe to sharpen, quickly to an edge he wets it, using six hard blocks of sandstone, and of softer whetstone seven. Straightway to the oak tree turning, thither stalks the mighty giant, in his raiment long and roomy, flapping in the winds of heaven. With his second step he totters, on the land of darker color, with his third step firmly planted, reaches he the oak tree's branches, strikes the trunk with sharpened hatchet, with one mighty swing he strikes it, with a second blow he cuts it. As his blade descends the third time, from his axe the sparks fly upward, from the oak tree fire out shooting, ere the axe descends a fourth time, yields the oak with hundred branches, shaking earth and heaven in falling. Eastward far the trunk extending, far to westward flew the treetops, to the south the leaves were scattered, to the north its hundred branches. Whosoe'er a branch has taken, has obtained eternal welfare, who secures himself a treetop, he has gained the master magic, who the foliage has gathered, has delight that never ceases. Of the chips some had been scattered, scattered also many splinters, on the blue back of the ocean, of the ocean smooth and mirrored rocked thereby the winds and waters like a boat upon the billows storm winds blew them to the northland some the ocean currents carried northland's fair and slender maiden washing on the shore a headdress beating on the rocks her garments rinsing there her silken raiment in the waters of poyola there beheld the chips and splinters carried by the winds and waters in a bag the chips she gathered, took them to the ancient courtyard, there to make enchanted arrows, arrows for the great magician, there to shape them into weapons, weapons for the skillful archer. Since the mighty oak has fallen, now has lost its hundred branches, that the north may see the sunshine, see the gentle gleam of moonlight, that the clouds may keep their courses, may extend the vault of heaven, over every lake and river, over the banks of every island. Groves arose in varied beauty, Beautifully grew the forests, and again the vines and flowers, birds again sang in the treetops, noisily the merry thrushes, and the cuckoos in the birch trees, on the mountains grew the berries, golden flowers in the meadows, and the herbs of many colors, many kinds of vegetation. But the barley is not growing. Vainamoinen, old and trusty, goes away and well considers, by the borders of the waters, on the ocean's sandy margin, finds six seeds of golden barley, even seven ripened kernels, on the shore of upper Northland, in the sand upon the seashore, hides them in his trusty pouches, fashioned from the skin of squirrel, some were made from skin of marten. Hastens forth the seeds to scatter, quickly sows the barley kernels, on the brinks of Kalu waters, on the Ozma hills and lowlands. Hark, the titmouse wildly crying, from the aspen words as follow. Ozma's barley will not flourish, nor the barley of Vainola, if the soil be not made ready, if the forest be not leveled, and the branches burn to ashes. Vainamoinen, wise and ancient, made himself an axe for chopping, then began to clear the forest, then began the trees to level, felled the trees of all descriptions, only left the birch tree standing, for the birds a place of resting, where might sing the sweet-voiced cuckoo, sacred bird in sacred branches. 
Down from heaven came the eagle, Through the air became a flying, That he might this thing consider. And he spake the words that follow. Wherefore, ancient Wainamoinen, Hast thou left the slender birch tree, Left the birch tree only standing? Wainamoinen thus made answer. Therefore is the birch left standing, That the birds may liest within it, That the eagle there may rest him, There may sing the sacred cuckoo. Spake the eagle thus replying, Good indeed thy hero judgment, That the birch tree thou hast left us, Left the sacred birch tree standing, As a resting place for eagles, And for birds of every feather, Even I may rest upon it. Quickly then this bird of heaven Kindled fire among the branches, Soon the flames are fanned by north winds, And the east winds lend their forces, Burn the trees of all descriptions, Burn them all to dust and ashes, Only is the birch left standing. Vainamoinen, wise and ancient, brings his magic grains of barley, brings he forth his seven seed grains, brings them from his trusty pouches, fashioned from the skin of squirrel, some were made from skin of marten. Thence to sow his seeds he hastens, hastens the barley grains to scatter, speaks unto himself these measures. I the seeds of life am sowing, sowing through my open fingers, from the hand of my creator, in this soil enriched with ashes, in this soil to sprout and flourish. Ancient mother thou hast livest, far beyond the earth and ocean, mother of the fields and forests, bring the rich soil to producing, bring the seed grains to the sprouting, that the barley well may flourish. Never will the earth unaided yield the ripe nutritious barley, never will her force be wanting, if the givers give assistance, if the givers grace the sowing, grace the daughters of creation. Rise, O earth, from out thy slumber, from the slumber land of ages. Let the barley grains be sprouting, let the blades themselves be starting, let the verdant stalks be rising, let the ears themselves be growing, and a hundredfold producing, from my plowing and my sowing, from my skilled and honest labor. Ukko, thou, O God up yonder, thou, O Father of the heavens, thou that livest high in ether, curbest all the clouds of heaven, holdest in the air thy counsel, holdest in the clouds good counsel, from the east dispatch a cloudlet, from the northeast send a rain cloud, from the west another send us, from the northwest still another, quickly from the south a warm cloud, that the rain may fall from heaven, that the clouds may drop their honey, that the ears may fill and ripen, that that the barley fields may rustle. Thereupon benignant Ukko, Ukko, father of the heavens, held his counsel in the cloud space, held good counsel in the ether. From the east he sent a cloudlet, from the northeast sent a rain cloud, from the west another sent he, from the northwest still another, quickly from the south a warm cloud. Joined in seams the clouds together, sewed together all their edges, grasped the cloud and hurled it earthward. Quick the rain cloud drops her honey, quick the rain drops fall from heaven, that the ears may quickly ripen, that the barley crop may rustle. Straightway grow the seeds of barley, from the germ the blade unfolding, richly colored ears arising, from the rich soil of the fallow, from the work of Vainamoinen. Here a few days pass unnoted, and as many nights fly over. When the seventh day had journeyed, on the morning of the eighth day, Vainamoinen, wise and ancient, went to view his crop of barley, how his plowing, how his sowing, how his labors were resulting. Found his crop of barley growing, found the blades were triple knotted, and the ears he found six-sided. Vainamoinen, old and trusty, turned his face and looked about him. Lo, there comes a springtime cuckoo, spying out the slender birch tree, rests upon it, sweetly singing. Wherefore is the silver birch tree left unharmed of all the forest? Spake the ancient Vainamoinen. Therefore I have left the birch tree, left the birch tree only growing, home for thee for joyful singing. Call thou here, O sweet voice cuckoo, sing thou here from throat of velvet, sing thou here with voice of silver, sing the cuckoo's golden flute notes. Call it morning. Call it evening, call within the hour of noontide, for the better growth of forests, for the ripening of the barley, for the richness of the northland, for the joy of Kalevala. End of Rune 2 Recording by Kyle Robb